I just want to say thank you so much for um, giving us some of your time. We know that this time of year is very busy, um, not only being a, a member of the Supreme Court, but also out of talking with the, the citizens of Ohio. So thank you so much for sharing your time uh, with us today. Uh, my name is Jeremy Blake with the Ohio Academy of Family Physicians. I have my colleague Lauren with us. Uh, she's our um, contracted lobbyist. And we both have been having a good time interviewing all the candidates for the Supreme Court this year. The Ohio Academy of Family Physicians mission is to improve the health of patients by advocating for and advancing the specialty of family medicine and providing viable solutions to the diverse needs of our members. A strategic goal is to, is to ensure that all members receive value for membership through meaningful engagement experiences and the Ohio Academy of Family Physicians' unwavering commitment to cultivate professional satisfaction. And this forum, uh, which we've been uh, gathering together, is a part of that strategic mission and goal. And so, Justice Fisher, again, thank you for being with us today. And I will allow you now some time to share uh, your background and any introductory comments that you'd like to, uh, to, like to make. So thank you, sir, for being with us. Thank you for having me. My background is kind of simple. I was a... Uh, uh, lawyer at Keating, Meath, and Klee Camp for almost a quarter century, just short of that. Uh, I was a part associate and partner. I had a practice that included travel all over the United States, about a million frequent flyer points with Delta, when Cincinnati used to be a Delta hub. Uh, I won a case in the U.S. Supreme Court the morning of the bush Kerry election 2004, which made me decide that one day I wouldn't be a judge which was quite an interesting conversation when you tell your wife you're going to spend day and night to get elected so you can take a huge pay cut. Very interesting conversation. Uh, I went to Harvard College, Harvard Law School, uh, St. Xavier High School down in Cincinnati. Um, I was president of the Cincinnati Bar, president of the state bar, um, and an appellate judge before going on the Ohio Supreme Court January 1 of 17. I've got one wife, one daughter, one son-in-law, two kids, two grandkids. Um, we used to have a dog. He uh, unfortunately passed away. Uh, one house. Uh, I don't know what else you want to know about me, but that's pretty much everything. Well, that's uh, <laughs> we appreciate that and uh, appreciate your sharing your family and your experiences. With all that being said, how do you think that shapes your judicial philosophy? Uh, I, I was quite the practitioner. Uh, the wording of the Constitution, the wording of the statute, the wording of a contract, let's say, very important to me and very important when I argued in front of courts. So I've been called a textualist, which I think that's probably accurate. Somebody the other day called me a common sense textualist, like that was an insult. And I said, no, keep calling me that. That's fine. Uh, because I think common sense does enter into it. And my difference, I think, than some judges is when I write an opinion, I write for the losing party and the losing lawyer. I think to keep support of the judicial system as a whole, the losing party must know that their arguments were heard, listened to, and why they weren't agreed with. I think that's very important. So I guess I'm a common sense textualist with a, a writing ability that focuses on the party that didn't win, because I think that's so important for general support of the judicial system. Speaking of general support of the judicial system, our country is experiencing an increase in partisanship and uh, polarizing political factions. How can the court be a model to promote civil discourse? Well, first of all, I know that you, the doctors are watching this and not the lawyers, but everyone would be proud of the way the court conducts conference after when we're discussing cases. Uh, the chief speak, let's say there's oral argument in the morning, we go up to the conference room. Chief Justice speaks first, and then we go in seniority, Justice Kennedy, then myself, and back and forth till the most junior justice speaks. You don't interrupt that person while speaking during that first round. But after all seven have spoken, it's kind of open discussion. And that's very interesting because people on there are smart or they have very smart law clerks and you can't say something stupid because you'll get cracked about it pretty hard. But then after people are talked out, then we vote 
in the reverse with the most junior and then going up to seniority till the chief votes last to break a tie in case there's a 3-3 tie. I think lawyers, doctors, all professionals would be proud because there's no lack of professionalism during that entire debate, even the open debate part. And it's very respectful. And if all, if all of us could be like that every day, I think we'd be better off. I even wrote an op-ed for the Cincinnati Enquirer well, about a year ago, I guess, maybe less, maybe six months ago. I don't know. But anyway, it was that lawyers should get together, the ABA, the state bar, the local bars, and take for two years one project, and that is to treat to teach all Americans how to disagree without being disagreeable, which is what we were taught as lawyers. And I think that would help the internet. I think it would help social media. I think it would help all of America. Couldn't do harm to lawyers' reputation either. But nobody took me up on the offer, so I don't know if it's ever going to happen. But I really believe in that. I think I wrote when I was on the board of the Cincinnati Bar, a civility code for the Cincinnati Bar Association. And it's just simple respect for other human beings. I mean, you could summarize it just even if you disagree with somebody, that doesn't mean you have to be a jerk towards them. And I think the court shows that in the way we conduct our hearings and the way we conduct conferences that the public doesn't even see. Does that answer your question, Laura? I'm, uh, I just want to, okay, make sure I'm answering. Yes, you did. Thank you so much, Justice. I wanted to ask about um, what would you consider your most difficult case and how did you handle it? <clears throat> Excuse me. I think it was actually when I was an appellate judge, uh, my first six months. Appellate judges usually don't deal with death penalty cases because under the state constitution, they jump from the trial court to the appellate court. Well, this had come full circle around and around. And on, on a Friday afternoon around three, the trial court in Hamlin County ruled that this person was competent to, to be executed the following Tuesday. And for those that don't know, there's three times that a defendant must be competent for the system to work. One, when they commit the crime. Two, when they're tried. And three, if to be executed the day of their execution. Now, competent to a lawyer may be different than what your physicians understand, but competent to the court is whether the person understands right from wrong, basically. So this man had been in prison for 27 years. And the, he had been on the gurney at least once, maybe twice, I can't remember exactly, but his lawyers were arguing he was no longer competent and could not be executed. Well, we got the case at three o'clock on a Friday afternoon and I was assigned as the lead. And I, and I, the other two judges, I guess, I went through 27 years of files to see everything that happened to this man and drafted an opinion saying he was competent, which was released on Monday. But it was, the, I know, I don't know the exact date, but it was the weekend my daughter graduated from law school because I went to the graduation, but I didn't have time to go to the parties and receptions and stuff because I was I, hard work. You asked how I got through it, hard work. And I got through it and I thought he was competent and by going through the files and the other two did too. So Monday we issue an opinion and to be honest, Tuesday he's executed. And my wife, very sad case, uh, this guy killed two people he it was the former girlfriend and the new boyfriend. And he had knocked on the door. He waited underneath the, they were in an apartment and they waited underneath the stairs for everybody to leave some party or something. And then he knocked on the door. The boyfriend came. He shot him like the arm or leg, put him in the, he, he, he uh, confessed all this. And all the forensics backed him up. He then ran in the bedroom. The, the woman knew that he was after her. She's trying to get out the bedroom window. He pulls her in, wounds her a little bit, throws her in the living room, 
tells the man, the, the boyfriend, to kneel and pray to his God because he's going to see him in a few seconds and then shot him in the head with a pistol. He then, I don't know how to say this exactly, took his shotgun, I think it was, but it was a rifle or shotgun and engineered it into her woman's parts and pulled the trigger and watched her bleed out. Um, but the, that wasn't the issue. He had been found guilty. The issue was, was he competent still? And there were doctors on both sides. But my wife calls me. She knows I'm worried about this case, first death penalty case. She says, I couldn't hear it on the radio, but he made a final statement. So I looked it up on the internet. And he had written a letter to the two families apologizing for what he did and the, what I, I remember specifically because he knew that what he had done was wrong. And it made me feel so much better that I had gotten it right. Whether you believe in the death penalty or not, you can't execute a person that they don't know why they're being executed. And thus, this was very important to me, despite how severe the case was, that the law be enforced as written. And it was. So yeah, that was by far the most difficult case I've ever had by, by a long shot. Wow. And as a follow-up on your professional and personal experience, can you describe an instance where you faced an ethical dilemma and how you resolved it? The best one to explain that would be when I was, I was not a judge yet. I was still a practicing lawyer. And in Cincinnati Bar Association, we have an ethical hotline that the numbers each month change. And then the mag monthly magazine, the numbers for the following month are put on the list. And I get a call from a lawyer. And if, for those that don't live in Cincinnati, this could happen to you. At the time, this was the early 90s, I think, or mid 90s. The lawyer had a call from a client who was thinking about killing themselves. And the ethical rules about telling the police or telling anyone about something a lawyer, uh, about a client had told you differed in all three states, Ohio, Kentucky, and Indiana. And I think the family was, the lawyer was in Ohio. The person thing committing suicide, I think was in Indiana or Kentucky, but they had met in Indiana. The, law, the legal relationship had started there. And I knew that, th that there was a difference in the law in each of them. And I didn't know what to tell that lawyer. So what I told the lawyer, it's probably not, I don't know if it's ethical or not, but I think it was the right advice. I told him to call the police, save the person. And if he was brought up on ethical charges, he could call me and I would represent him for free. Because, I mean, that's just, what a difficult situation to be in. And uh, that's how I resolved it, just kind of common sense. But I never heard back. So either the person lived or the, maybe the lawyer never had the, you know, was never charged with any ethical problem. But uh, I assume things went well, because otherwise I think I would have heard from him. But that was very, I mean, you're on a hotline, you're supposed to be able to answer questions but all three states had different ethical rules. So trying to tell that lawyer how to act, very difficult, very hard, but you also couldn't, couldn't take time to do research because the person, he was keeping them, he was talking, I could hear him talking to the client on the other line as he's talking to me, trying to get ethical help about what he can do. And I said, get off the phone with me, dial 911, wherever that person is, and get the police there or somebody to help him. Or who, uh, maybe it was a woman. I think it was a man. But uh, yeah, it was the most difficult ethical question I've ever been asked. And uh, I've, I've been asked a lot of them because I used to uh, chair the ethic, Ethics and Professional Responsibility Committee and used to help write some of the ethics opinions and things like that. So yeah, even... That was the hardest by far. Thank you, Justice Fisher. Well, you know, in politics, you know, we vote once a year on candidates. 
Uh, but when we volunteer in the community, we get to vote every single day on the kind of community that we want to live in. Do you believe that volunteering and community service is a necessary commitment for persons holding public office? And what types of volunteering and community service have you been involved in? Yes, I believe it's very important. Uh, I believe most people should have two types of community service and professionals, whether you're doctors or lawyers, engineers, whatever, three. One for your local community, one for your greater community, and one for your profession. So for profession, as I said earlier, I was very active in the Cincinnati Bar and the State Bar as president of each of those. I was on so many committees, I won't name them all because it would take a long time to do that. But that was my giving back of my time to my profession, especially when I was on the committees, like, like I said, the ethics and professionalism committees and writing ethical rules and putting into day-to-day -day force rules that would affect lawyers directly including in malpractice cases. <clears throat> For the local community, I was president of the Pleasant Ridge Community Council. Cincinnati has 50 neighborhood councils. And I was president part of the time when they were thinking of moving Pleasant Ridge School out of, Cincinnati, out of Pleasant Ridge and creating a new school in a neighboring neighborhood. Well, I worked very hard to keep it. So yes, there's still a Pleasant Ridge School. They knocked down the old building, but we didn't want it knocked down because it's beautiful because they had rook, what's called Rookwood Pottery. For those from Cincinnati, you would know what I'm talking about. But we did get them by, all these votes were by one vote on the Cincinnati School Board. To, to take out, they had to pay extra money for the uh, construction company to take the, rook, rook, the better Rookwood Pottery pieces out and save them for the new building. And then we got it changed from a regular grade school to Pleasant Ridge Montessori, a neighborhood Montessori school, not, not a, a, a magnet school or something. But to go there, you have to live in the neighborhood. Unless it's not filled, then you can come from a different neighborhood to go to that Montessori school. And it costs more money. I didn't know this when we started. It costs more money to have a Montessori school because the rooms have to be bigger because of the materials you have or something. I don't know. So we also... Yeah, because we wanted to have three good schools in walking distance for the citizens of Pleasant Ridge. And so we have Pleasant Ridge Montessori. We have TCP World Academy, which is the only charter school whose grade board scores go up in Hamlin County all the time. And then we have a Catholic school, a nativity grade school. So whatever choice you want, you got three choices and you can walk your kid to school. And that was my local service. Then my greater service, I was on the Hamlin County Mental Health and Recovery Services Board. I think that's the technical name, but it's very long. Uh, and I really believe that those two uh, mental health and recovery services have to be combined. A lot of people separate them, and I know a lot of counties have separate boards, but so many people have what's called co-occurring diseases alcoholism may be a mental health issue or a drug addiction and maybe a mental health issue that yeah some of our money we gave were just to mental health or just to addiction services but a lot of it was combined so that people with those co-occurring problems could get help from both and stuff like Talbert House and First Step Home like First Step Home I really wanted to promote it. This is the first one in Hamlin County where a lot of women that have addiction problems and recovery problems and mental health problems, there's no place to go to if you want to take your kid. And that was a limiting factor, but the first step, fix that all up. And I, I really promote places like that because I think residential is good. And you, if you have kids, you're not, the odds are you're not going to leave your kids at home with a mental health and addiction serve problem. But if you have a place that that can happen, those kind of places are really big. So I, I, I really was pushing for places like that. So, you know, state and local bar for my profession, Pleasant Ridge Community Council for my neighborhood, 
and Hamlin County Mental Health and Recovery Service. I had others that I was on, but I think those represent my view that you, you know, it's unfortunate for you docs uh, that I think you should get back to your profession, but I really do just like, I think lawyers, engineers, uh, architects should get back to theirs. But uh, yeah, we, as professionals, we, I think we have three obligations, not just two. Well, that's, that's great. And, you know, thank you so much, Justice Fisher, for, you know, giving us some insight into the things that you care about in your leadership and, I really do appreciate you uh, giving us some time today to give us that insight and that forethought. And uh, did you want to maybe perhaps say some closing comments uh, while we close up our interview here? Yeah, I hope, hope people vote for me because I think I'm doing a good job and I think I'm more experienced than my opponents. So please vote for Fisher with a C for common sense. Very good, Justice. And again, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you all. Very good. Well, uh, Judge Jameson, you know, thank you uh, very much for giving your time out of your busy schedule. Uh, we know it's getting into the prime time for campaign season and for reaching out to uh, voters throughout the state of Ohio. Um, you know, we very much appreciate you participating in our Supreme Court candidate forum. Uh, we want to make sure that they, we have a commitment to professional satisfaction and making sure that our members are aware of uh, the candidates that are running in key positions throughout our state government, and obviously the Supreme Court is a part of that. Um, I would like to give you some opportunity to share your background and uh, make an introduction and say hello to our members. And if you want to go ahead and take that time to do that now, feel free to do so. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Jeremy and Lauren, for the opportunity to be with you today. My name is Terry Jamison. I am originally from Welch, West Virginia where um, I grew up in a small coal mining town. Um, initially, after high school, I worked uh, for the United Mine Workers of America as an underground coal miner. Um, it was uh, one of the things that um, I believe that it was an opportunity for women that was coming open to move into that industry. And so I began working for um, U.S. Steel. Um, when I was laid off there, I transitioned to another company called Olga Coal, uh, which was initially um, subsequently purchased by JVL Steel here in Ohio. After um, being laid off there and being laid off for more than a year, I moved to Ohio in 1983. Uh, gained some new skills, uh, landed a job with the Xerox Corporation, and also worked for OCLC, um, the Online Computer Library Center in Dublin. I uh, found a full-time job as an office manager for an insurance agency, where I worked for another two to three years before um, my employer suggested that I start my own business. I started my own business, owned a multi-line insurance agency for 16 years. So I have 16 years of experience as a small business owner, hiring, training, um, uh, running my own office, uh, securing your own office space, all of the things that go with that, filing your taxes, making sure that everything's in compliance. So I did that for 16 years. Um, while I was um, deciding what I wanted to do and make my next step, I went back to school. I started at Columbus State and uh, transferred all my credits over to Franklin University. So as a full-time working person, a uh, non-traditional student. I graduated from Franklin uh, Cum Laude with a business uh, administration degree and a minor in human resources management. After some uh, thought about what I wanted to do next, I decided to sell my agency and enroll in Capital University Law School. Again, as a non-traditional student, I went to uh, law school during the day and then 
worked nights to help pay for um, those grown-up expenses, having your own home and car and all those things that you have when you decide to go back to school. So uh, I finished law school, passed the bar the first time, worked for the public defender's office for a short time before going out and hanging out my own shingle. Uh, sharing office space with several other attorneys and having the offices in Springfield, Mansfield, and Columbus and traveling around the state owning, um, representing clients and, you know, um, having ownership of my own law firm. Um, I, in that capacity, had to hire interns and um, staff to help with those cases and I've represented individuals in domestic, juvenile, and uh, probate court and I've tried every type of criminal case except a death penalty case. So I've represented individuals from felony ones all the way down to a felony five misdemeanor cases across the state in many counties. Uh, with that experience under my belt. Um, I, when I was asked about running for a uh, judge, I really hadn't given much thought to that, but I was given that opportunity in 2012. I uh, went out and got on the ballot and was successful being elected my first time uh, to the Domestic Relations and Juvenile Court of the Court of Common Pleas in Franklin County. Um, one that raised by 10 points, which was significant for a first-time candidate, um, was successful in securing my re-election by 20 points. So I served over eight years on the Domestic Relations and Juvenile Court, and after that, I was elected to the um, Ohio Court of Appeals, where I currently sit now, and I won that election by seven points against a three-term incumbent. So I have uh, won three races rather significant in uh, politics, particularly for women and women of color to win with those type of point margins. So I um, am now running for the Ohio Supreme Court. I, it's just amazing experience with your you know, the background that you share and your experiences. How do you think all of that from you know, being a coal miner to now in the judiciary, how does that shape your judicial philosophy? Well, it shapes my judicial philosophy because my philosophy is that everyone deserves equal justice under the law. Um, I don't care if you're a union member. I don't care if you're a white collar business owner. Um, I don't care who you are. You deserve the right to have your voice heard. And that has been my strategy throughout my legal uh, career, making sure that I'm listening to my clients um, as a judge, making sure that I'm listening to the litigants, that I'm not imposing upon them something that they're not asking for. Um, one thing, I have a, a background in domestic uh, relations mediation. So when people come, um, you have to learn how to listen then you have to rephrase what it is that they are seeking. And even with litigants that are standing before you, you want to be sure that you're hearing what they're actually in the courtroom for. Um, many times uh, attorneys represent things or um, you may hear something a different way. And that's why rephrasing, speaking back to people is very important to make sure that you're really hearing what they're saying. So I believe it shapes my judicial philosophy because I want everyone to have fair and equal access and the opportunity to be heard and a ruling that they know that the judge took into consideration their issues and their concerns. Thank you, Judge Jameson. The country is experiencing an increase in polarizing political factions and partisanship. How can the court system be a model for promoting civil discourse? And thank you, Lauren. That's an excellent question. I believe um, as a judge now on the 10th District Court of Appeals, I have to work with people. Um, I think that one of the things that we have to 
remember is that the law equalizes. The, the law is the great balancer of facts. And even though we're polarized, everyone wants to be heard and everyone wants equal justice. One thing that I have done, uh, this is actually the first time that I'm ever running with a partisan label. So um, I have never put politics out in front because the court is no place for politics. The court is the place where you follow the law, you review the facts. If the law is not on your side, which sometimes it's not because we have an adversarial system, you have to write a decision that lets people know why the law is not on their side. Uh, but as far as getting into the political arena, politics have no place in the court. Thank you, Judge Jameson. From your experiences uh, being um, on the court, what would you say is your most difficult case and how did you handle it? Um, some of the most difficult cases that I have faced uh, on the court are cases that involve juveniles um, that have committed uh, delinquency offenses that if they had been an adult would be considered a felony. Those are difficult because the children that are coming before you, oftentimes um, we've looked at the data and statistics come from places of abuse, neglect, dependency themselves. So they're trauma uh, cases. And the legislature, the legislature has passed regulations that require that some of these children be bound over to adult court, that we transfer jurisdiction away from juvenile to adult court, and that they be tried as adults. Those are difficult cases, particularly for the child that it's their first offense, but because of the type of offense it is, they have to be uh, prosecuted as an adult. So those are difficult cases. Piggybacking off of Jeremy's question about your personal and professional experience, can you describe one instance and when you in which you faced an ethical dilemma and how you resolved it? Well, one of the ethical dilemmas I had, um, I was on the bench one morning and I was filling out some notes and I heard a case called, and I can't remember the other party's name, but the, the one party's name, the plaintiff's name was Jameson. So as I'm sitting there, I look up and I begin, I look over and I see someone that I kind of recognize, but haven't seen for a while. So I wasn't sure if it was a relative. So I uh, went on the record, I asked questions, found out that it was indeed my first cousin that I thought it was, uh, put on the record that I was going to recuse myself from the case because I, I could see no way um, that the other person would not feel that they were prejudiced in the handling of the case. So um, when we're faced with these ethical dilemmas, uh, could I have gone forward with the case? Probably, because I would have ruled based on the law. But would the other party have felt that they were treated equally, fairly, and without any bias? They would not. So I thought it was up to me to recuse myself. I got another date and actually uh, had a conversation with the lawyer. I said, did you think to ask, since they had the same last name, if we were related? And oddly enough, they did not. Always interesting. <laughs> in, uh, in politics, you know, we vote once a year uh, on candidates. Uh, but when we volunteer in the community, we get to vote every single day on the kind of community that we want to live in. Do you believe that volunteering and community service is a necessary commitment for persons holding public office? And what types of volunteering and community service have you been involved in? Excellent question, Jeremy. We are public servants that just happen to be judges. I definitely have my own volunteer work. I've been a volunteer with the American Red Cross since 2014 or 16. I'm a blood, amb uh, blood drive ambassador. I've also worked alongside um, them serving 
at different functions, uh, golf outings, um, in different places where they're doing fundraisers. I can't actually solicit for funds, but I can volunteer, check people in for the golf outing, check people in for um, different events that they have. I also volunteer with the uh, National Council of Negro Women. Um, we do um, different drives around the state, around healthcare, education, financial literacy. Um, so I do a lot of community engagement and particularly through my church, we do a lot of um, community engagement, um, supplying school supplies, coats to children, shoes to children, um, feeding the homeless. Uh, we did during COVID when everyone was closed in, we did drive up um, cleaning supply uh, drives where people donated cleaning supplies that we could give to the different homeless shelters to help them keep everything clean and disinfected while they were under quarantine or um, safe at home, I guess I should call it. Um, so um, it, it's critical. And then I also work with young people. I've been a moot court coach. I've been a moot court judge, mock trial judge. Um, mentoring with children is very important to me because we need to make sure that we're raising up opportunities for the next lawyers and judges that are going to come behind us. Well, that's, uh, thank you so much for your service and for what you've done. And thank you for giving us again your time today to participate in this forum. And uh, we very much appreciate uh, you sharing some uh, some more insight about you as a person and uh, your uh, your role and leadership that you're going to provide in the state. So uh, thank you so much.